True Crime South Africa is published in conjunction with Arena Holdings, publishers of Times Live, Business Live, Sowetan Live and others. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily represent the views of Arena Holdings and its affiliates. The two ships glide past each other in the darkness. One towers over the other as they sidle up in the choppy waters just off Saldana Bay. Then an exchange happens. The smaller boat becomes a ton heavier and makes its way back to the harbour. It's just a matter of time now. This is True Crime South Africa. I'm Nicole Engelbrecht and you're listening to episode 91, The Windward. This episode is sponsored by Dialabed. If you're listening to this podcast in bed, you should know that the quality of each day is decided the night before. Sleep your way to a new and more vibrant you. Behind every mover and shaker, there is a perfect mattress. And Dialabed has your back with South Africa's widest range of bed brands. Upgrade your bed today by visiting a Dialabed store or shopping online at dialabed.co.za. A huge thank you to Dialabed for supporting True Crime South Africa. Before we get into today's episode, I'd like to thank our new Patreon supporters for the week. A huge thank you goes out to Leonora Levis, Nicola Vile, E.H., Elizabeth Devine, Tammy Carter-Smith, and Suzanne van der Vee for your support on Patreon, as well as Abhishek Dole, Charles Stafford, and Carla De Silva for your support on PayPal. Thank you so much, everyone. Your support really does make a huge difference. If you'd like to support the show on Patreon or PayPal, I'll leave a link in the show notes. In addition to the shout-out and monthly exclusive episode that Patreons get, I also now upload an ad-free version of every week's episode to Patreon. So if you prefer not to hear the ads, head over to Patreon and sign up for a minimum monthly contribution of just $1, which at the moment is about 16 rand. It's a pretty good deal. If you like discounts, because who doesn't, head over to King Online for your health and beauty needs, print crowd for all your printing requirements, and use the code TCSA10 at checkout for a 10% discount and support the show at the same time. You can also get 10% off when you order from Wallpaper Online by using the code TRUECRIME at checkout. Other forms of support that make a huge difference include following the show on social media, inviting your friends, family, postman, hairdresser and parole officer to listen, and leaving reviews on the podcast platform you use. I've covered quite a few pretty heavy cases recently, both here in the standard feed and on Patreon. All horrific, senseless murders that I know are often difficult to listen to, and certainly are not easy to research and talk about. So this week I thought I'd do something a little different. This week I thought, let's do some drugs. Um, let's try that again. This week I thought, let's talk about a case involving drugs. Since the early 90s, South Africa has been overwhelmed by the influx of drug trafficking. As new and more addictive hard drugs hit our streets, we started to see the knock-on effect of that in other areas. More child neglect, more petty thefts, even more murders. In fact, today's case may not be as far removed as we'd like to think from the standard true crime murder cases I usually cover. Think about it. In many of the cases I cover, either the perpetrator or the victim has had some sort of substance use issue that in some way played into the crimes. They aren't the cause of it, let's make that very clear. But even if we just look at some of the gang-related crimes, for instance, there's almost always some history of drug involvement. So in a way, Today we're going back to one of the roots of many of the cases I've covered. 
how the substances that devastate so many lives come to be in our country in the first place. My sources for this episode include the episode of Distart Tian on Via TV and several media articles and studies. So let's get into episode 91, The Windward. The following episode may contain sensitive material including descriptions of violence, sexual assault or graphic descriptions of injuries to victims. If you feel you may be triggered by such material, please consider this before accessing our content. To access trauma counselling or services, please see the helpline information on our show notes. Crime intelligence in South Africa has been in the news a lot lately, for all the wrong reasons. With the riots that happened in July last year and the recent spate of tavern shootings, people have started to question whether South African crime intelligence is actually a bit of an oxymoronic phrase. But I think that today's case shows that, at least in some aspects, our intelligence network in this country is still working. The Crime Intelligence Division is a division of the South African Police Service, but for obvious reasons, they do not report to the same heads as other police officers. The division is run by a provincial head, who in turn reports to the National Intelligence Coordinating Committee, or NICOC. The division is tasked with gathering, collating and analysing information about criminal activities in South Africa. They also conduct counter and covert intelligence operations. Intelligence is gathered in a variety of ways, but as is the case with the SAPS, they often rely heavily on information received from their informant network. Informants are often people closely linked to the very criminal organisations the division is tasked with gathering information on. Why they become informants differs, but often it will be because they themselves have committed a crime and instead of going to prison, they agree to act as informants. As with any law enforcement agency in the world, organised crime, especially the intricate network of drug traffickers, are always a top priority for South African police. And often, when the low-level drug dealers are bust, that can lead to intelligence that takes agencies higher up the ladder. The higher up the ladder you get, of course, the more the spider web of money leads you to other crimes. It's certainly not unheard of for a drug smuggling syndicate to also be involved in illegal drug running, human trafficking, and on occasion, the funding of terrorist organizations. They will get involved in whatever makes them money. So in 2020, when a tip came into crime intelligence that there were huge shipments of illicit drugs headed for the Western Cape, the lead was taken very seriously. We often hear about people getting bust bringing drugs in through our airports, and that certainly is one way drugs can make it in. But really, those are just the small fry. One person can only carry so much on them, and coordinating drug mules is tricky and expensive. With the amounts of drugs we know are available in South Africa and the world on a daily basis, it stands to reason that this cannot be the only source of hard drugs. The really big shipments have to be coming in somewhere else. When this tip came in to police in 2020, they were given just a single name, the Windward. Record showed that the vessel had started its life as a fishing boat and soon began to carry cargo too. Police were able to locate the Windward in Table Bay Harbour, where it had been docked for several months. Surveillance units were immediately placed in the harbour to monitor activity on the boat. Then, police went about figuring out who owned the boat, and that search led them to a Bulgarian national, 51-year-old Arsen Georgiev Ivanov. Ivanov had been in South Africa for a few months. He had a wife and children back in Bulgaria, 
and although he'd qualified as a civil engineer in his home country, he was listed as unemployed at that time. He'd rented an apartment in the Island Club Hotel and Apartments Building in Century City. Surveillance was placed on the apartment too, and police waited. In January 2021, surveillance units at Table Bay Harbour reported that the Windward had set sail. Its destination, according to Harbour Records, was Saldana Bay Harbour, to perform maintenance. Saldana Bay is a natural harbour, which was named after Antonio de Saldana, the captain of a vessel in Albuquerque's fleet, which visited South Africa in 1503. He actually first gave the name to Table Bay Harbour, which is where he'd first dropped anchor, but when Table Bay was renamed, the name Saldana Bay got passed down to the beautiful coastal area 75 nautical miles down the west coast. The harbour, which initially served only fishing vessels, was converted into a deep water port in the 1970s to serve the collection of iron ore transported from Sishin in the Northern Cape by railway. It is into this harbour that the Windward sailed in January 2021, and surveillance units were ready and waiting to keep an eye on its movements there too. Lieutenant Colonel Johann Smith had been put in charge of the operation at this point, which soon grew to involve provincial organised crime units, narcotics divisions within SAPS, crime intelligence, a special task force, international law enforcement and local SAPS members. While maintenance did indeed begin on the vessel, 100 kilometres inland at Evenhoff Century City Flat, he seemed to have a visitor. Later that month, surveillance units noticed the arrival of a new man in Evenhoff's apartment. The man was soon identified as 47-year-old Mario Asev. Asev was also a Bulgarian national. He too was listed as unemployed. So what, police wondered, could these two unemployed tourists possibly be doing in South Africa, living in a pretty luxurious apartment building? Back at the Windward, maintenance on the vessel seemed to be continuing. The vessel itself, though, was a bit of a ghost ship, with almost no one on board except the maintenance crew. But that was all about to change. On the 28th of January, six men arrived at Cape Town International Airport. The men were from Myanmar, the country formerly known as Burma. The six men, ranging in age from 27 to 55, were collected by a car at the airport and transported to Saldana Bay, where police watched them board the Windward. Almost a month would go by until there was another arrival at Cape Town International. Another two Bulgarian nationals, 45-year-old Borislav Atanasov and 53-year-old Atanas Bekov, walked onto South African soil and joined their fellow countrymen at the Century City apartment. It seemed clear at this point that the pot was about to come to the boil. On the 25th of February 2021, the Windward left Saldana Bay to perform a seaworthiness test. This would be a series of exercises performed by the crew with the vessel, far enough away from the harbour to replicate open sea conditions, but not so far that if the vessel were to fail, they would be too far from help. The Windward stayed out at sea overnight and returned to the harbour on the 26th of February. The police would later say that they'd been monitoring the vessel during this time. They did not disclose how this monitoring happened, and considering it would be pretty difficult to tail a boat on the open sea, I'm assuming it could only be done by a satellite system that tracked the vessel's location. Although the Windward sailed back into harbour on the 26th, it had not even docked before it turned around and left again. This time, 
the vessel went further out to open sea than it had during its seaworthiness test the previous day, and once again, police were watching its movements. Off the coast of Soldana, the windward was soon dwarfed by a much larger vessel sailing right beside it. As the two vessels neared one another, the crew on the larger ship began to offload cargo onto the windward. Over the course of 30 minutes, packages were transferred onto the smaller vessel, and then the larger vessel moved off into the night. The windward returned to Soldana Bay. Police now knew that there was a very good chance that some illicit transfer had been made between the two vessels that night. The larger of the two vessels, which belonged to a Brazilian owner, was left to sail away. There was no point in stopping it and risking tipping off the crew of the Windward when there was every chance that nothing of criminal value remained on the larger vessel. Instead, police kept keen eyes on the Windward, and another surveillance unit kept eyes on Ivanov and his visitors in Century City. Days crept by, and police started to wonder if they'd somehow missed their chance. But then, on the 1st of March 2021, Ivanov and his three colleagues got into two vehicles and drove together out of Century City. Surveillance units followed as the Bulgarians turned onto the West Coast Road, and soon it became clear that the men were headed for Soldana Bay. Surveillance units contacted those with eyes on the windward and told them of the development. All the other role players in the operation were advised to start descending on Soldana. It was now or never. Police still had no idea what they were going to find when they boarded the Windward. Their informants had claimed it was a large haul, but they could well have been chasing a red herring. Only time would tell. The key, though, was to connect the four Bulgarian men with the vessel. They could already connect Ivanov through his ownership of it, but the three other men could easily claim they were just visiting Ivanov if they weren't arrested while actively interacting with whatever illicit goods might be on the vessel. As the two cars carrying the Bulgarians neared the harbour, task force members were under strict instructions to hold their places until all four men were on board the vessel. Lieutenant Colonel Johann Smith sat in an unmarked vehicle not far from the harbour. This moment was the culmination of months of painstaking surveillance work, and just one error could blow the whole thing. The seasoned police officer watched as the four well-dressed men stepped out of their vehicles, each walking to the boot of their respective cars and taking out large sports bags. With these slung over their shoulders, they proceeded toward the vessel, and Smith's heart pounded with every step they took. They ideally had to be on the vessel for this to stick. The minutes the four men stepped onto the boat, the alarm was sounded, and the SAPS and task force members swarmed the windward. Ivanov and Bekov made an attempt at escape, Dodging their would-be captors momentarily, the two men tried to make a run for their vehicle, happy to leave their colleagues behind to face the music, but they were soon overwhelmed by the sheer number of officers on the scene, apprehended, handcuffed, and led back to the vessel. The other two Bulgarian men were also arrested, as were the six Mayan Marie's men who'd been acting as crew on the vessel. With the men in custody, Police searched the boat, and what they had come for was not hard to find. There, stacked on both decks of the boat, were enormous piles of black brick-shaped objects. The objects wrapped in black plastic were emblazoned with a crown logo and the name King Coca. And to the trained eye, it was clear that each contained a kilogram of likely very high-quality cocaine. Also found near the cocaine were more black sports bags, identical to the ones the four Bulgarians had carried onto the ship. Some of the bags were already packed with bricks of cocaine. 
It would take days to eventually ascertain exactly how much cocaine had been seized that day, but the final tally would come to 973 bricks. Almost a tonne of cocaine, with a street value of 580 million rand. It was the second biggest haul to date in South Africa and the largest in the Western Cape at that point. Lieutenant Colonel Johann Smit accompanied the 10 men to Friedenburg Police Station where they were booked on charges of drug dealing. With Ivanov in custody, a warrant was obtained to search his apartment. In it, police found yet another illicit treasure trove. It was very clear that the so-called unemployed men were living a rather lavish life. The cupboards were filled with designer suits. The fridge was packed to the brim with expensive food, and high-end cigars sat in triangular piles throughout the apartment. But it was a discovery in the cupboard of the main bedroom that really took the cake. There, police found 1.23 million US dollars in cash, 4,000 euro and 50,000 South African rand. Also present were several money-counting machines, typically used in large-scale organized crime operations. With even further evidence of illicit dealings, Lieutenant Colonel Johann Smith contacted Advocate Aradana Hiramun of the National Prosecuting Authority to whom the docket had been assigned. It was time to take the case to the next level. The Bulgarian men secured private defence attorneys, while the Mayan Marie's men relied on state-appointed defence counsel, and it became clear from the outset that the case was going to be particularly challenging from an administrative perspective. Court proceedings were being conducted only in English. Four of the men spoke only Bulgarian, and the other six spoke only Burmese. A Bulgarian translator had been easy enough to find, but getting someone to translate in Burmese proved far more challenging. Advocate Hiramun described how the Burmese translation issue had almost threatened the entire case. By the third postponement, the judge had ruled that the defendant's rights to a speedy process were being infringed upon, and if the state could not come up with a Burmese translator by the next appearance, which was in just a few days, all charges would have to be withdrawn. It's also important to remember that this case was happening during a time when international travel was frowned upon due to the pandemic, so simply flying someone in, which would ordinarily be easy enough to do, suddenly became an almost insurmountable obstacle. By some stroke of luck, though, the day before the next scheduled hearing, Advocate Hiramun received a call from the Myanmar embassy. They would be sending a translator to assist their citizens in their court proceedings. The state and the investigation team heaved a sigh of relief. But the surprises in the almost unprecedented case were not finished. As soon as the six men were able to speak with someone who actually understood them, a very different and pretty tragic story about their involvement surfaced. It emerged that the six men had been the victims of human trafficking. The men had been lured out of Myanmar with promises of legitimate work in South Africa and further dangled carrots that their families would be allowed to follow them to the country after they'd established themselves here. Myanmar is a country that has been devastated by political turmoil for decades. As a result, a large percentage of the population are destitute, and at least a quarter of the Myanmar's people are undocumented. This fact makes it very easy for unscrupulous people to lure citizens out of the country and create fake identity documentation for them. The biggest targets of human trafficking in that country are women and young girls who are regularly sold into forced marriage and childbearing situations with men in other parts of Asia. As they are undocumented, it is extremely difficult for these people to be found. 
Men like the six found aboard the Windward are often used as either drug mules or in other illegal operations conducted by organised crime groups from other countries. Many family members of Mayan Marie's men report that their loved ones were offered jobs in other countries and never returned. South African authorities, in cooperation with Mayan Marie's officials, were able to interview the families of the men and also eventually obtained an admission from Ivanov that the men had indeed not known anything about the work in South Africa involving drugs. What was not established, or at least not reported to the public, is who had been behind the human trafficking of the men. Because Ivanov had not arranged it himself. He'd simply been informed when to send a car to the airport. Charges were withdrawn against the six men, and arrangements were made to safely transport them back to their country of origin. Ivanov would also admit that one of his Bulgarian colleagues had also not known that drugs were on the boat. Borislav Atanasov was also released without charge and deported back to Bulgaria. During the investigation, it emerged that Ivanov and Vasev had entered South Africa using fraudulent documentation. They had done so through a neighbouring country and had not arrived in South Africa through an airport. Additional charges were added to Ivanov's charge sheet for this crime. In May 2021, it seemed clear to the three remaining defendants that there was a literal mountain of evidence against them and they weren't going to be able to dodge the charges. To avoid a long, drawn-out trial, which would be even more extended due to the translation requirements, a plea deal was reached with each of the defendants. Ivanov, who was deemed to be the head of of that immediate operation, agreed to plead guilty in exchange for a 25-year prison sentence on the drug charge and a one-year sentence on the Immigration Act charge. Thirteen years of the sentence would be suspended, meaning he would serve 12 years direct imprisonment, upon which he would be deported back to Bulgaria. Vasev reached a similar agreement. He was also handed down 25 years imprisonment, but 12 years were suspended, meaning he would serve 13 before being deported. Bikov got off with the lowest number of years in that he was handed down 10, with 5 suspended, but he also had to pay a 2.5 million rand fine to the criminal assets accounts. In all, the bust netted 580 million rand in drugs and 43 million rand in assets. Perhaps most importantly, it had made a sizable dent in the cocaine supply to the South African market. But when some journalists spoke to South African gangsters in the know, they just smiled. They said, it was all not what it seemed. And as far as they were concerned, the Saldana Bay bust had been a red herring. The gang members alleged that while police were focused on almost one ton of drugs in Saldana, it was very likely that somewhere else in South Africa, the real shipments was entering, unseen and untouched. It seems like a huge amount of drugs to be using as a red herring, but in a world where billions exchange hands, maybe it's just a drop in the ocean. We know for sure that drug mules are often set up as distractions, with tips being given to airport officials which focus them in on a particular individual while another individual slips past with even more drugs on their person. So it wouldn't be the first time the ruse had been used in the world of drug smuggling. While the Saldana bust was most certainly a win for South African police, it's still very clear that Ivanov was not the mastermind behind this. In fact, he was probably very low down on the ladder. The prosecutor did say that police had continued investigations in an attempt to track down other members of the syndicate, but these tracks are often really well covered. For the most part, people like Ivanov will never know who they actually work for. They only know one level above them and one level below. And the same goes for everyone else. No one ever knows 
who the person pulling all of the strings is, and tracing back to that person is often almost impossible. There are two clues in this case that could point in a direction, though. The fact that the larger vessel from which the drugs were offloaded was Brazilian, and the stamp on the outside of the cocaine bricks. The Brazil connection was not isolated, and it turns out this is not the first big drug bust that had happened in Saldana Bay either. In 2011, the captain of a Maltese-owned ship which had docked in Brazil before heading for South Africa made contact with South African authorities while still at sea. Members of his crew had stumbled upon packages of what they believed to be cocaine hidden in their ship. The captain was directed to Saldana Bay Harbour, where the ship was searched, and 155 kilograms of cocaine was found on board. It was believed that while the ship had been loading in Brazil, someone had snuck on board and hidden the packages. The month after that, another bust was made on a Brazilian-owned ship in Saldana. That haul consisted of 116 kilograms of cocaine. When journalists spoke to gang members in 2021, and they claimed that it was possible the real shipments had come in elsewhere, they specifically mentioned both Mossel Bay and Neisner as being hotspots for cocaine smuggling. Indeed, what had up until that point been the largest cocaine bust in South African history happened in Neisner in 2011, when 1,700 kilograms of cocaine was found on a vessel there. But after the windward, the floodgates seemed to open, and new record busts were regularly being made. On the 2nd of June 2021, 1,800 kilograms of cocaine were uncovered on a towed jet ski. Then, even that new record was blown completely out of the water, if you'll pardon the pun, when 2,541 kilograms of cocaine was seized from a container depot on the 22nd of July, as well as 715 kilograms from police vehicles on July the 9th. All of that cocaine had come from Brazil. After the windward busts, journalists also uncovered that one of the reasons for the very large shipments suddenly arriving in South Africa was that the pandemic had disrupted supply chains, and as a result, the market needed to be restocked. Sources would also claim that the cocaine had been destined for the hands of the 28th prison gang, and that further disruption in supply would increase tensions between gangs, both inside and outside of prison. But there's another reason that such large shipments of drugs in general are now being seen moving across the world. Super cartels. The word cartel is defined as a group of independent market participants who collude with each other in order to improve their profits and dominate the market. This can apply to both legal and illegal businesses, of course. And in this context, it applies to the drug market. Organised crime groups across the world have seen major changes in how they operate in the last decade or so. With increased crackdown on drug and human trafficking, the bosses of some of the biggest crime families and groups in the world made a decision. Although most of these international groups are essentially sworn enemies, a few years ago, they started working together. Top mobsters from countries including Morocco, Italy, Bosnia, Chile and Ireland all had connections in the Netherlands, and it was there that they decided to start pooling their resources. Rather than each of those groups trying to buy and move drugs on their own, considering they were all dealing with many of the same suppliers in South America and Asia, the super cartel started pooling their money and buying larger amounts of especially cocaine at lower prices in order to make a higher profit. Their end markets remain split, and they're all still responsible for their own operations. But they've essentially become the macro of cocaine. 
Sorry, Mecra. These super cartels are international law enforcement's worst nightmare come true. Historically, the separation and tension between these groups had almost always played in favour of law enforcement. But now, with these hugely powerful criminal groups all working together, it's become far more difficult to plug the holes of supply. Although one major super cartel has seen many of its members arrested in recent years, the very nature of the criminal organisation means that there is always someone there to take their place. So why South Africa? Certainly, we do have a huge substance use issue in this country. But we're far from the biggest market in the world in terms of narcotics. Well, the truth is that only 20% of the cocaine that enters South Africa will ever be destined to be sold here. The vast majority of it is destined to be distributed through South Africa to other countries. We are not the destination. We're just the transit hub. According to the website insightcrime.org, due to South Africa's well-established ports and relatively close proximity to Brazil by sea, we have become the easiest thoroughfare for cocaine from the port of Santos in Brazil. Most of the drugs coming from that port arrive in Durban Harbour, but a good amount also moves through the Western Cape's ports. From Durban, after a small amount has been split for local sale, most large sea-travelled cocaine hauls will move on to Australia, with some being transported by air to Europe and Hong Kong. Mozambique and Angola have become Brazil's chosen destination for drug trafficking by air, presumably because their air travel customs regulations are less resourced than in South Africa. We know that two of the Bulgarian men in the Windward case came into South Africa illegally through an unnamed neighbouring country, and it's very likely it was one of those. Interestingly, some of the cocaine that's flown into Mozambique will eventually feed into South Africa by road. South Africa has become a crucial nexus in the cocaine trade, at least for the South Americans. And as a result, we've also become a temporary home for many high-level heads of international crime groups. In December 2021, Cuban drug lord Nelson Pablo Yeste Garrido was arrested in the United States on various charges. The man, who allegedly worked alongside the infamous Pablo Escobar at one point, was revealed to have been living in South Africa for 20 years. He was arrested in 2013 in Port Elizabeth after being found in possession of a huge haul of cocaine, but his case was mysteriously withdrawn and he fled the country soon after. So, if our country was a suitable home for that long for a man with Yesta Garrido's record, who else is living among us? I have an interesting personal story that helps to illustrate that you never really know who your neighbours are. A few years ago, I lived in a nice, quiet crescent in Parklands. The street was really your very average suburban one. Well-kept lawns, people walking their dogs, families just living their lives. But there was one house in our street that was becoming a bit of a bugbear and our street WhatsApp group was often lit up with complaints about it. The reason for the complaints was that the darn alarm kept going off in the middle of the night, and the direct neighbours never could get hold of the owner to get them to sort it out. One elderly lady actually watched the house for days, hoping to catch sight of the owner, but the only person she saw entering was a woman who identified herself as a domestic worker and who was not keen at all to chat to her neighbour and actually closed the garden gate in the woman's face. The owner would occasionally visit the house in a bright red Ferrari, which stood out like a sore thumb. 
But even when my neighbours were quick enough to get outside the house in time to see the car entering the premises, the driver ignored them and closed his garage and gates behind him without interacting. Such a rude man, the street agreed. The alarm problem peaked and waned for a few months, until one morning, while I was at work, our WhatsApp group exploded. There are hundreds of police cars in our streets, one rather over-exaggerated message read. They're raiding the alarm house. In the days that followed, it turned out that the man in the Ferrari and the owner of the house down the crescent with the annoying alarm, was none other than Jerome Donkey Boyson, the alleged leader of the Sexy Boys gang. The raid we'd witnessed that day had been part of a coordinated strike by the Hawks on properties owned by Boyson across the Western Cape. Boyson was arrested and millions of rands of assets were seized, including several imported sports cars, which were being kept at the Parklands property. We don't know if there were any drugs in that house, but drug distribution was among the charges that Boyson now faces. Although we were all very put out that we had a high-ranking gangster for a neighbour, the man who lived right next door to the house had a very different priority. He walked up to a member of the Hawks who was standing outside the house, and as the officer gazed quizzically on, probably expecting to be asked all the juicy gossip, the neighbour simply asked, Hey, while you guys are in there, would you mind disconnecting their alarm, please? And that is how deeply entwined the underworld is in our daily lives. That is how a ton of cocaine on a boat in Soldana could end up in a house next door to you. You know, the one with the annoying alarm. And while the people who control the drug trade make billions, drive around in Ferraris and smoke Cuban cigars, the people who essentially make up the market for them are the ones that really suffer. People living with substance use disorders and their entire families suffer the true consequences of these devastating substances. And because those with substance use disorders are criminalised, it becomes a vicious circle of crime. In many countries in the world, that is shifting. In Portugal, for instance, the use of illegal narcotics is not a criminal offence. People with substance use disorders are instead given support, if they want it, to get clean. Police there put their focus on the manufacturers, traffickers and dealers. In countries like Canada, safe injection sites are available for those using injectable drugs. In those spaces, substance users are provided with clean syringes and a safe place to use in case of overdose, which for many is a regular experience. Are these solutions perfect? Absolutely not. But I do think they are far better than criminalising a person with a substance use disorder so that their disorder becomes the defining moment in their life, rather than a bad patch they can work through. In my opinion, putting users in prison only serves to ensure that they will never get into recovery or find gainful employment, and instead it puts them right on track to becoming career criminals in the pursuit of their next hit. South Africa becoming this transit destination and seemingly safe haven for drug lords and other organised crime rings plays a knock-on effect in almost every other arena of crime. Guns, gangs, human trafficking, and certainly corruption within state departments. So it turns out that while the Windward was a great bust for the SAPS and a success story, it really was just a drop in a very murky and pretty terrifying ocean.
Thank you for listening to episode 91, The Windward. If you'd like to hear more victim-focused true crime content, please subscribe to True Crime South Africa on the platform you're using to listen right now. If you're looking for something still related to real-life stories, but often with a more positive slant, you can check out my new podcast series, I Live Through This. You can follow both podcasts on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'll be back next week with another episode. Until then, thank you for your support, and I'll chat to you soon.